is the newest title from Leader Games, the creators of Root, Oath, Vast, Fort, and Ahoy, you know, all the four letter games. And Ark seems to take major concepts from two of those titles being Root and Oath and sort of kind of redefines them and makes it kind of its own thing. Because honestly, Ark is a war game, sort of, but also it's a bidding game sort of, but also it's a trick-taking game, and you guessed it, sort of. <laughs> the goal of ARCs is like many games, it's to gather victory points, whether you have enough to close out the game early, or whoever has the most by the end of five rounds, or chapters as they call them in ARCs. And you're going to be scoring on many different cylinders, being who has the most of a certain type of resource or resources, who has destroyed the most pieces, and who has the most civilians and agents captive. Now the means of actually achieving all of this is a dynamic system that plays somewhat like in typical cool whirly design style, taking mechanics and concepts and warping them into his own unique style. This is really his specialty. In arcs, there are four suits that each can do multiple types of actions, and players will be playing cards from their hand of six, one at a time until everyone passes, or until everyone inevitably runs through all of their cards. Now, the first player of a round plays the lead card. This can be any card from their hand, and it will determine what kind of round everyone might be playing. Now, they can do all actions on the card they played, up to the pip amount shown under the value here. But then other players in clockwise order will have a choice on how they want to interact with the lead card. Now, they can either surpass it, they may surpass the lead card by playing a card of the same suit, but of a higher value. And in this case, they are able to use all of the action pips on the card that they just played. Alternatively, they can play one action card face down, and it can be any card in their hand, and they're able to do one pip from the lead card. And kind of similar to copy, they can pivot, they can play a card face up that doesn't match the lead suit, and they get one action pip off of that card. Lastly, along with any of these options, you can always play an additional card face down in order to seize the initiative, essentially giving yourself the ability to play the lead card on the next round. And if nobody seizes, then the highest card of the lead suit that was played, including the lead card itself, that player will then have the initiative. So that is going to be a player's turn. They are going to look at their hand of six cards and they're going to choose one to play. And depending on what they play, that's going to determine whether they get all the action pips on their card or maybe one action pip on their card. Now I've mentioned initiative a couple of times and I want to talk a little bit about what is so important about actually having the initiative. Well, besides the sick initiative marker that you get when you claim initiative, this is actually key for one major reason. Well, a couple, but one major reason that I want to talk about right now, which is that you can claim Ambitions are how points are scored in arcs. See, every chapter has no set scoring. It is determined fully by the players what conditions need to be met for scoring. Well, not just any players, the lead players, the players with initiative. Now, when you play the lead card of a round, you have the option to declare an ambition. The number values on those cards each link with a scoring condition, and when you declare, you take the ambition linked with your lead card, moving the highest unclaimed victory point marker from the supply to that ambition box for scoring at the end of the chapter. What this actually means is that you have to plan out one, how do I actually get the initiative? And two, how do I actually claim the ambition that I want? Because if I'm looking at my hand at the beginning of a round and I see that I don't have any six value cards, that means that I likely won't be able to claim the M path scoring condition, even though I have all of these psionics in my ship's hold. So really quickly, I'm gonna talk about all of the available ambitions and the value of card needed to declare them. First up, we've got the two value cards. This is how you claim the ambition of Tycoon, which is going to be whoever has the most material, 
fuel, and all the matching guild cards to those. Whoever has the most of those will be scoring Tycoon. Then we've got the three value cards, which are linked to Tyrant. This is going to be the player who has the most captives on their player board by the end of the chapter. Then we've also got Warlord, which is kind of similar to Tyrant. This is going to be the four value cards, and this is based on who has destroyed the most enemy pieces. So who has the most pieces on their trophy box on their board? Then we've got Keeper, which are the five value cards. This is based on who has the most relics and also guild relic type cards. And lastly, my personal favorite, and I really don't know why, I just, I like this resource, is going to be the six value cards, which is for Empath. This is who has the most psionic resources and psionic guild cards out of the group. They're going to be scoring the Empath Ambition. Now there are also one value cards that can't declare any ambition and seven value cards that can declare any ambition, but these are only used in four player games. Now here's a really, really important concept in the game. When you are actually declaring an ambition, you're going to be putting an ambition declare marker covering up that number value on your card. And what this does is it actually makes that value zero, which gives all of the other players a really, really easy way to take the initiative from you. So you kind of got to be careful when you claim an ambition because it's very likely that you won't have the initiative for the next round. So hopefully that doesn't foil with your plans at all couple of more weird thing about the actual ambitions. There is only three tokens and they have, you know, higher numbers and lower numbers. You have to automatically take the highest current available ambition and place it into the box that you declared. But at the end of each round, there's going to be the lowest token. The lowest scoring token is going to get flipped up. It's going to be on its orange side. It's going to give you even more victory points. So then you organize them from highest to lowest. And over the course of the game, you're going to see that these victory points are going to get more and more as the chapters go by, which is awesome because it means that players that are behind have the opportunity to get a lot more points the later in the game, which is great because they might be able to get back into the game. Nobody is truly ever out. But we're going to go back to playing a card because now that we know what the ambitions are and now that we also know how the general card play in the game works and how you get access to actions, we need to talk about the actual actions themselves. What exactly can you do in the game in order to work towards these potential ambitions that could potentially get declared? The build action is pretty self-explanatory. You can build cities, which help you produce resources. You can build starports, which help you produce ships, and you can build ships from those starports. Then we've got the tax action. Now the tax action is where you can use those cities in order to actually gain the resource that the city is on. The cool thing about taxing though too is that if you control, meaning that you have the most undamaged ships in a system, you can actually tax opposing rival players cities in order to get the resource and when you do that, you take one of their little agent tokens and you put it in your captives box, which is really rude. All right, so you got a ton of ships now on the board. Well, you probably want to move them. So there is the move action, which allows you to move any group of ships from one space to an adjacent one. Or you can do something really cool. If you're moving out of one of your star ports, you can actually catapult around the map, basically doing a large jump. It's really, really cool. It's a way to get around the board a lot faster. It's one of the reasons why star ports are so important. You've got the repair action ships buildings, they can all be damaged. And when they're damaged, they're basically flipped to their side or flipped over in the case of a building. Well, they basically all have two hits because once they're already damaged, if they get hit again, they're out. So repair action's awesome. You can just flip those pieces up. Doesn't matter where on the board they're at. You can just flip them up. That's the repair action. Then you've got a really interesting action, which is the influence action. And this is actually going to use the agents in your supply. Now the influencing is kind of this bidding type of mini game throughout arcs where you're going to be placing these agents on these guild cards. Now these guild cards, you might want them for so many reasons. You might want them because of the actions that they provide. You might want them because of the suit that they are. They might work towards one of your ambitions that you're working on, but when you influence, you can basically place an agent onto a guild card. I'm gonna talk about the next action right now because it directly is in line with this action and that's called 
the secure action. So you can secure a guild card if you have the most agents on that guild card. And you're actually gonna take all of the other agents that were there and those all go into your captives box. So this is a really, really good way to work towards that tyrant ambition. And lastly, we have got the battle action, which is pretty wild. It's probably the most complicated action to teach when you're teaching the game. And that's because in arcs, they don't just give us one type of dice. They give us three types of dice, which is honestly wild. It's really, really fun though to kind of pick and choose what kind of dice you want. You can basically choose dice up to the number of ships you have attacking. And you can choose the skirmish dice, which are like a 50% chance to get a hit, but there's no way that you can take any damage in the combat. You've got the assault dice. These are kind of like, uh, they, they do more damage, but they have risks of basically taking hits as well. And then you've also got the raid dice. These ones are so much fun. These are high risk, high reward. You're going to take a lot of damage very likely. Most of the time you won't even get what you want, but sometimes you can get these key symbols and those key symbols interact with a lot of the game's uh, systems. You can steal resources from an opponent because on their player board, they're going to be carrying those resources. And then also you can steal guild cards from other players. Every guild card is going to have a little key amount and you might be able to steal those with the raid dice. Now the raid dice can only be used when your opponent has a building in a system, but still this can be a really, really fun game mechanic and it can swing ambitions your way because you're taking a resource from an opponent, let's just say, and putting it into your supply. So that is all of the actions that you can find on any of the cards that you're going to be playing, but those cards will only have a couple of those actions available. So when you are playing an aggression card, that's going to allow players to move battle as well as secure cards. But when you play a mobilization card, that's going to allow you movement and influence. So all of these kind of have different actions that you're able to use. And that's kind of what I meant when I was talking about how the lead card determines a bit of how that round is going to play out because it gives access or easier access to these types of actions. But there is a way to break that rule. And it's one of the things that is really, really tricky to get good at in arcs. And that is that all of the resources in the game are kind of linked to an action. And this is called So when you play a card, you can actually spend a resource before doing any of those action pips, you can spend resources from your hold in order to do in action. So for example, you can spend a material to do a build or repair action. You can spend a fuel to do a move action. You can spend a relic to do a secure action. You can spend a psionic to do any action on the lead card. And lastly, you can spend a weapon in order to make any of the action pips on the card that you played this round battle actions, which is awesome. It's a really cool way to turn any round, no matter what was the lead card, into a time to fight. There's also prelude actions on guild cards, and those can be used at this point right before you're doing your action pip. So this is kind of one of the ways that you can extend your turns throughout the game. And it's something that's honestly really hard to balance because on one end, you might be saving up those resources for the ambitions, like you might be going for Tycoon, but it might be really advantageous to use those fuel to get to a really weak spot in your opponent's infrastructure and take advantage of that moment with some raid dice. So always some really tough decisions there. All right, so of course, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the guild cards that you can find in the game, just to give you an idea of how wide and vast and how much variety is in the game, because these guild cards really do determine a lot of that particular game's flavor, which ones are floating around being raided by each other, what abilities are in play. My favorite in the multiple games that I've played, uh, one, one big favorite of mine is the Fuel Cartel. Now this card says that you can keep the fuel supply here on this card. You add it towards the Tycoon Ambition, but you can't spend it as if it is yours. And on top of that, as a prelude action, you may discard this to steal one fuel. 
I find these guys to be so much fun because I just love that feeling of hoarding all of the fuel and immediately it always makes everybody try and tax their fuel planets in order to take away from my supply. It's a really, really fun card that actually changes the game a lot. It makes things really, really interesting when acquired. We've got the Galactic Bards. I cannot help but think that this might be an ode to Jabba's Palace and all of the alien musicians there in Star Wars Return of the Jedi, which of course is why I'm sporting the shirt. Love me some Star Wars, love me some Easter eggs, but this card is also really, really cool. It says that when you surpass or pivot before taking any of the actions on your card, you may declare the ambition on your played card if an ambition has not been declared yet this round and you do not place the zero marker. So it's a really, really cool way to get an ambition out onto the board, even though you were not the lead player and you didn't have initiative. How fun is that? And you can keep doing that. Like this card stays in your tableau. This will continue to happen. The only problem is it's a one key card, meaning that this thing's probably going to be stolen quite a bit because it's really, really, really easy to raid. Which leads me to the Sworn Guardians, which is another relic card, but this says that this has to be the first thing stolen. So nobody can steal your resources. They can't steal your other guild cards. They have to use keys to steal this first. So you might be able to use this to protect those galactic bards. And lastly, I'll talk really quickly about Mining Interest, which is a material type card. It actually gives you an alternate build action. A lot of the cards, a lot of the guild cards in this game can do this, which is really cool. It basically gives you an alternate way to use build action. So instead of doing the standard thing, you can just gain one material with any build actions that you have, as long as this is in your court. So freaking cool. I absolutely love it. Now, if you've played Root and you're wondering how asymmetric is this game, it's really not that asymmetric at the beginning. The standard game, you don't really have any beginning asymmetry. You're just going to be kind of working on getting these guild cards and those will kind of determine how different you are. But you guys know me. You guys know that I love my asymmetry. That's like the whole freaking thing. The, the reason why this channel exists is basically just because of asymmetric games, if we're being honest, Root in particular. But there is a leaders and lore kind of mini expansion that comes in the base box of arcs. And I highly recommend playing with this mode. We just jumped straight into it. I know in the rule book it says don't, but I mean, if you're coming from a background of Root, Y'all know asymmetry, okay? So this is going to be a little bit different. You're going to be drafting a leader card. It's gonna have a special ability, usually one that's good, usually one that's bad or terrible. And then you can also draft these lore cards, which is another special ability. This also comes with unique starting resources, unique starting setup. So th these are very, very different. They really determine the flavor of your gameplay. Some of them will be really good at collecting certain types of ambitions. Some of them have all new actions and ways to interact with the game. This makes you feel like you have your own kind of faction that you're playing with. And I know that me and my group, we won't be playing without this ever if we're playing uh, arcs. So this is definitely something that I would highly recommend looking into and including. There's also even a mini expansion that comes with more leaders, more lore cards. I'll give kind of an example of one of the classes that I was playing once, which is the Fuel Drinker. And this is definitely one of my favorite leader cards that I've played with so far, but their first ability is insatiable. When you copy or pivot in order to do attacks, you gain one fuel along with the taxed resource. So you're going to be acquiring a ton of fuel. You also start the game off with two fuel, but lavish after scoring, you must discard all your fuel if the tycoon ambition was scored, which sucks really, really bad. And I found that I was often not even going for the tycoon ambition. I was actually just using all the extra fuel to be a menace on the board. I was able to move around everywhere and attack my opponents. It was so much fun. And I also had galactic rifles, which gave me the ability to attack in adjacent systems, which was so freaking fun. So I think I have given a clear idea of one, how the game works and two, all the actions available to you, three, all of the different variables like the guild cards, the leader cards, the lore cards, 
all of that stuff. And also the game flow, how the game operates round to round and scoring also being player determined where you can just kind of choose what scoring happens. Now I want to talk a little bit about how the game actually feels when you're playing. And this is kind of more of a final thoughts portion as well. Just basically everything that I want to say, probably just me gushing about it a little bit. So when you're playing arcs, it feels like you are taking control of this empire that is just getting by. It's just getting by. You're trying your best to survive and thrive, but it just feels like you're controlling this little group of space cadets that are just failing at every job they go towards. You're looking at your hand of six cards and you're thinking, you know, this hand sucks. And you know, you might get another hand. And you're like, okay, this seems really good but I don't have the ability to do what I wanted to do. Most often I've found that in this game, and this is either a benefit or a disadvantage, but for me, it's a, it's a huge benefit. The hand that I get is kind of what determines what I can do. Even though I want to go for a certain ambition and score a certain type of points, my hand will tell me something different and I have to listen to it. I have to work out that puzzle. I have to figure out what I can actually do. The way that the trick-taking system, the action selection system works, creates so much drama in such a simple kind of framework. Like you might not have the resources to do what you want, but you might be able to keep taking the initiative, but then your empire doesn't get as many actions. So you're going to be falling behind, whereas other players might be able to be getting a ton more actions. It's like being the leader of the initiative isn't always the best thing, but sometimes it's the exact right thing. And I think the arcs is so much fun because it is about opportunism. It is about who can see the best path and who can take advantage of situations as they arise. It's a little bit harder to do proper long-term planning. I think there is space for long-term planning. There's definitely things that you're going for round to round and chapter to chapter. But I think the game's best points are those moments where you're like, I see the line and I am going to follow that thread all the way through and boom, I just had a 14 point turn that was insane. Like there are things that happen like that and it is super, super cool and very, very interesting. So yeah, this game is stressful. It makes me sweat, but I can't get enough of it. I am addicted to this game. Like when I played it for the first time, I immediately said, we're playing again. And I'm reaching out to people, trying to get them to come over to my house to play more. Cause I just want to play it. Like, I don't know this, this, I haven't really had this kind of addicting feeling of a game since root. And it's, it's really funny that it's another cool whirly design and it is, you know, it's, it's in the same kind of area space. You got tokens, you got, you know, warring ships. It's, it's kind of, it's not anything like root, but it still kind of has that DNA. It feels like a cold whirly design, the resource management. I love the resource management because it's so weird. You're like, it's like a closed economy. You've got these five resources. Once they're out, they're out. Like if, if I can't collect fuel, I can look on the board and be like, yo, you have the fuel. Now I'm going to go and raid you because I just need a fuel. Like, you know, I might not always say that about fuel, but boy, you don't let me get, don't, don't take all the psionics because I'm going to be coming for those psionics. I like those psionics a lot. They are fun. Dude, if you have a psionic and a relic, there's some crazy combos because you can literally, let's just say a mobilization card is played. You, you play out the psionic, you get a, an action from the lead card, you know, you influence a guild card, then you can just spend the relic and immediately get that guild card. Like, that's crazy. So there's all these like little, little strategies that you can figure out throughout the game just with the resource management. I think that if you like games that are puzzling, hard to master, a lot of card play, tableau building, bidding, a little bit of trick taking, sort of, doesn't really feel like a trick taking game, like I said, but the mechanic is there. Beautiful artwork, dynamic, dynamic fighting and battling. Uh, Arcs might be the perfect game for you. I know that right now it is my current obsession and I am playing this game a lot. In fact, I'm going to be playing this game tomorrow night 
as the day of this recording, I already got another day set up. So I'm set. If you guys have checked out ARCs already, I would love to hear your thoughts on this game. Leave them down below. If you have any questions regarding the game, I would love to answer them down below as well. As you can tell, I really like this, so it's very likely that there will be more content on this game coming out on the channel. So if you guys want to see something in particular, would love to hear your ideas and thoughts down below as well. But guys, that is it for the video. Let's go ahead and drop the beat.